Uh, what we're now going to do is we're going to create the inverse trig functions using those ideas that we just saw. We're going to have to restrict the domain because if you think about trig curves, there's no way they're going to satisfy a horizontal line test. So we're going to work out which piece we're going to use and uh, let's see what they end up looking like. So let's start with inverse sine. Our original sine curve, let's draw it in, y equals sine x. Its domain at the moment is, of course, all real x. Its range is minus 1 to 1. No good, doesn't satisfy horizontal line test. So we want a piece of that curve that will get the complete range. Remember, we said, well, OK, there's, there's several choices I could make. So I want to try and include 0 and, and positive numbers. Well, in this case, yes, I can do that. I'll include some negative numbers as well. The, uh, the logical piece to take would be from uh, minus pi and 2 to pi and 2. We get a complete range. We've got 0. It's nice and symmetric. Um, it's good. So my restricted domain will be minus pi and 2 to pi on 2. The range then, I've captured all of it. I've got it from minus 1 to 1. So our new function, y equals inverse sine of x. And by the way, this is why we have the reciprocal ratios. You'll never see a negative power on a trig function. So if you see minus 1, don't think, oh, that's 1 over sine x. No. That's the inverse sine of x. We never write sine x to the power of negative 1 like that. We use cosec x, if we want to say that. So the domain will be the old range. So my domain will be minus 1 to 1. And the range will be the old domain, the restricted one, minus pi on 2 to pi on 2. Now, because of my scale, it's going to be a bit hard to draw it on the same diagram. Because you'll notice on the y-axis, there's 1. But on the x-axis, there's pi, which is 3.14, etc., etc. So, uh, I would reflect it in this line, y equals x, if I could. Well, I can, but it won't look real nice. So, I'll draw in the new one. And if you've got a, uh, a math aid, it's great. Because you can draw the same curve every time. you just got to get the right piece of the graph to go... So I know minus 1 to 1, pi on 2 to minus pi on 2. Whee, there it is. It's that little piece of the sine curve. Now, don't confuse it with the tan curve. The tan curve, of course, looks very much like that. But it goes asymptotic and it also comes through 45 degrees, the tan curve. Don't confuse it with the cubic. The cubic has the horizontal point of inflection. It is a sine curve on its side. That's basically what we're drawing there. Let's have a look at cosine, which should look very similar. Inverse cos. So the original cosine curve. Let's draw that one up. Domain, all real x. Range, once again, is minus 1 to 1, but also fails horizontal. I can't choose the same restricted domain. If I go minus pi on 2 to pi on 2 with this one, it'll fail the horizontal line test. So the piece I'm going to pick, because I want to include zero, going to go for positives, I'm going to go from zero to pi. Zero to pi. So restricted domain, zero to pi, and again, I, I get the whole range. So inverse cos x, its domain will still be minus one to one, just like inverse sine, but its range will be naught to pi. Let's draw it in. Now, this explains why your calculator does what it does. Because a calculator is just using a function. So when you ask, oh, what angle to get your cosine, and if it's in the second quadrant, it gives you an answer in the second quadrant. So if you go, what's the inverse cos of negative a half, for instance? It'll give you the second quadrant answer. Because it's using the inverse cos function. And it would look up minus a half, read off and go, oh, that's whatever angle that is. Whereas if you were to use the inverse sine graph, it gives you a negative acute angle. Because if you were to look up negative half on the inverse sine graph, it reads down to negative acute angle. And so that's, as I say, is why uh, our calculator behaves like it does. Because it's just a machine, it's just using the particular function to get an answer out. Right? And because it deals with functions, 
it can only give you one possible answer rather than, than several. So, all right, let's do tan. Okay, y equals tan x. There it is, y equals tan x. Its domain is, well, all real x except every pi on 2 multiple, well, plus or minus pi k. Actually, I didn't need to write plus or minus pi k, did I? Because I stated k was an integer, so I could have just said plus pi k, because integers can be negative. So, but anyway, doesn't matter. That still describes the domain, the range, or real y. So I want a piece of the tan curve that will not fail the horizontal line test. And uh, I think it, well, I hope anyway, it's kind of obvious which piece we'll, we'll pick, because those asymptotes divide it up quite nicely. But remember, there's asymptotes at pi and 2 and minus pi and 2, so it's not equal to. It's just less than in there. And the range is all real y. So inverse tan x, domain is now going to be all real x. The range will go in between minus pi and 2 and pi and 2. So let's draw it. It'll end up being on its side. It'll look like, I should say, a tan curve. There it is, on its side y equals inverse tan of x. So also with your calculator, that's why it gives you answers of negative acute angles when you, you put negative numbers in. But some relationships when we're playing with inverse trig, some, I guess, inverse trig identities for want of a better word. Inverse sine of minus x is equal to the minus inverse sine of x. Why can I say that? Look at the graph. It's an odd function. It has rotational symmetry. So if I want to find the inverse sine of negative x, I can always say, well, that's minus the inverse sine of x. Odd function. Cosine, though, you'll notice, does not have symmetry. But it does if I shift the curve. Yeah. So this is why it's inverse cos of minus x will equal pi minus the inverse cos of x. Yeah. Because you've got an odd function shifted up Pi on 2. Pi on 2. How does it turn out to be pi rather than pi on 2? Uh, inverse cos, if I shifted it back to the origin, would look like that. Well, that's obviously not inverse cos. That's when I've shifted it back to the origin. So this is the curve. Inverse cos of x minus uh, pi on 2. We moved it down, didn't we? So that would be the curve. Now, that is an odd function. Okay? So let's call that function x. We agree that's an odd function? So therefore, function negative x is equal to the negative of function x. So let's sub in. Inverse cos of negative x minus pi on 2 is equal to the negative of inverse cos of x minus pi on 2. Uh, expand the parentheses, we get minus the inverse cos of x plus pi on 2. Move the pi on 2 over, and that's why it's pi rather than pi on 2. So we get pi minus <laughs> the inverse cos of x. So... That comes from the odd function being shifted up pi on 2. Uh, inverse tan, that one is symmetric. It's got rotational symmetry. Another odd function. So inverse tan of negative x is equal to minus inverse tan of x. And there's one other relationship. Inverse sine of x plus the inverse cos of x will always equal pi on 2. Angle sum of a triangle. If you've got a right angle triangle, one angle would be the inverse sine of x. The other angle would be the inverse cos of x. So therefore they've got to add up to be 90 degrees or, or pi on 2. So, let us pretend we haven't got our calculators. Find the exact value. So here comes those ratios again. They're always cropping up. What uh, angle, we've got to think angle that gives us pi on 3, exact value is... Pi on 3, 60 degrees. <laughs> Who looked at the sheet? Yeah. Yes. Inverse tan of 1 is pi on 4. Pi
pi on 3 minus pi on 4 is pi on 12. Inverse sine of 1 on root 2 minus inverse sine of minus a half. Okay. Pi on 4 minus, the inverse sine of minus a half is minus pi on 6. Inverse sine gives us negative acute angles. The other way we could have done that is we could have looked at our relationship up here. Inverse sine of minus x gives us minus the inverse sine of x. So 5 pi on 12, 5 pi on 12. The cosine of the inverse sine of 40 on 41. Remember, inverse trig is talking about an angle. Right? So inverse sine of 40 on 41 represents an angle. We're saying, what is the cosine of that angle? We don't need to go to a calculator. All we've got to do is draw up a triangle. It represents an angle. So I'll say it's that one. That angle is the inverse sine of 40 on 41. Therefore... The opposite over the hypotenuse, 40 over 41. Pythagoras gives me the other side is 9. I can now just read off the triangle. Cosine of that angle is 9 on 41. 9 on 41. Safer to do it that way, unless you've got nice numbers, because if you start having surds involved, you go to your calculator, you're going to get decimal approximations rather than exact values and, and, and things like that. The inverse sine of the sine of 5 pi on 6. Now, it would be very tempting to say the answer is 5 pi on 6 because inverses cancel. But unfortunately, inverse sine, its range is between minus pi on 2 and pi on 2. It can't give me the answer 5 pi on 6. The answer is pi on 6. Okay. So how do I work that out? I say, well, okay, I know inverse sine will only give me an acute angle or a negative acute angle. So I say 5 pi on 6, which quadrant? Second quadrant. And the second quadrant is sine positive or negative. So it's got to give me the positive acute angle, pi on 6. 5 pi on 6 would be equivalent to the acute angle of pi on 6. Okay. The sine of 2 times the inverse cos of 3 fifths. It's basically saying sine 2 theta. So if I let theta be the inverse cos of 3 fifths, there's the angle draw up a triangle so I can get all the different ratios I want. Cosine adjacent over hypotenuse. Other side's 4. So I'm going to get 2 sine theta cos theta. Notice it's important to write let theta equal that and then write 2 sine. If I just wrote 2 sine theta cos theta, that makes sense. It's also handy to do that so I don't have to keep writing inverse cos 3 fifths. Inverse cos theta. Otherwise I'd say 2 sine inverse cos blah. Okay, sub in. Sine theta is 4 fifths, cos theta is 3 fifths. And there's my answer, 24 on 25. The inverse cos of 2 times the cos of pi and 3. Ah, this is the inverse cos of 2 cos. It's not cos 2 theta. It's the inverse cos of 2 times some ratio. Well, I can work out cos pi and 3. I know that's a half. So this question is really saying, what's the inverse cos of 1? Oh, well, 0. The tan of the inverse sine of 2 thirds. Well, there you go, and 2 thirds is not a nice one. Inverse cos of a quarter, but inverse cos of something that's not nice is not a big deal because we can always draw the triangle. But these will be different triangles, of course. Don't make the mistake of thinking these are somehow got to be forced into the same triangle. We've got two different triangles. I'll put alpha in one. The inverse sine is 2 thirds. So the other side's root 5. I'll put beta into another triangle. Its inverse cos is a quarter. Other side, root 15. Okay, now I should be able to substitute in for tan alpha plus beta, tan plus tan on 1 minus tan tan. Uh, 2 on root 5 plus root 15 over 1 minus 2 on root 5, root 15. Eventually, oh, look at that. What a great... It just feels like there should be some cancelling there, but there's not. <laughs> uh, yeah, you got three, oh, three fives or fifty. Oh, no. You could rationalise the denominator, I suppose, but nah, too much work. Okay, there we go.